platform doesn't actually exist. First of all, I think Malta is very smart, yeah? They're a little country and to gain relevance, they have to do something innovative, big, different. So Sophia the robot is only as good as the information that she can actually provide mm -hmm. or have under her. There's a fundamental issue with that. You shouldn't put a, a, a dollar value to human life. So, but, the but that's the way insurance companies work, surely. Welcome to Down the Rabbit Hole, your easy to understand podcast on the blockchain and beyond. My name is Tim Lee, and thank you so much for joining me on this journey into the ever evolving and sometimes elusive world of the blockchain. In this episode of Down the Rabbit Hole, we will be looking at how artificial intelligence and blockchain could work together. We will be talking to Penny Wong, an artificial intelligence specialist who also has a deep interest in the blockchain. We discuss the challenges and the opportunities presented by the combination of the two technologies. Could blockchain be used to validate the data necessary for artificial intelligence to run? Does it have the scalability to carry out such tasks? Let's find out as we head down the rabbit hole. Nothing in the Down the Rabbit Hole podcast should be considered as investment or legal advice. The blockchain and cryptocurrency markets globally are unregulated, high risk and constantly changing. You're advised to seek professional guidance before contemplating any opportunities within the blockchain and cryptocurrency space. I'm really delighted to have a very wonderful um, expert uh, with me today. Someone I've known around the traps for about a couple of years now, I guess, overall, probably off and on. Mm. Around that sort of time, maybe. I mean, but it's, it's, it's Penny Wong. We've got Penny Wong, <laughs> who is the CEO and founder of an AI, uh, an AI platform called Radmis. Yes. Um, and it's very much that Penny, I have seen run the traps in the blockchain space. She's really enthusiastic about the the blockchain. It's very rare to have somebody that's got that deep lens on the AI side, but also a deep interest in blockchain. So. Mm -hmm. Welcome, Penny. Thank you very much for for coming on the show. And uh, I'll yeah, you know, I'll get you to give everybody an introduction as to who you are and wh how you got into AI and how you got into blockchain in just a second. And then we'll we'll sort of continue on looking at AI and blockchain and how they're going to work together. So, what brought you into AI and what got you interested in blockchain? Oh well, going going back that far back, as far as I can remember, probably when I was three, my father put me in front of Star Trek. So that, okay. that kind of triggered everything off. It's his fault. Right. <laughs> um, Gene Roddenberry, the producer, he's got a lot to answer for. <laughs> Captain Kirk. Yeah. <laughs> Love that. So I have, you know, basically watched probably 90% of all sci-fi movies since then. So you can imagine oh, right. what I'm thinking. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Ob obsession. <laughs> the Matrix, <laughs> Down the Rabbit Hole, which is perfect synergy in terms of, you know, what I've followed over the years and um, what you've been writing about as well. Right. Okay. So it's a fascination with science fiction, which is becoming science fact now, isn't yes, it? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Because I, I always remember Steven Spielberg when he did the Minority Report. Oh, he I love spoke that. about science fact rather yes. than science fiction. Yes. Um, and, and all that sort of stuff. So I, I can understand that idea of being addicted to, not addicted to technology, but enthralled by the technology so yeah. so so sorry anyway you got involved in that when you yep. yeah through star uh, trek and through yep. your fascination with with films yep yep and what uh, was your decision to actually get into a profession in that? i have a love of kit from knight rider and data from star trek and i've always had this vision that one day before we leave this or before i leave this earth i'll be able to get involved or experience that to experience data and... Data from Star Trek, yes. a hybrid with Kit from Knight Rider. <laughs> okay, no. <laughs> forgive me. I'm, I mean, I'm not as... That's a I'm bit not... far-fetched, I no, know. No, 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 no. It, it's, I'm just... I'm fascinated by it because, I mean, Knight Rider I've seen a few times. Yes. Star Trek, obviously, I've seen a lot of times. Yes, yes. How do those come together? How? I, I mean, you're saying that's your fascination. I'm, I'm just curious. How does that come together? That's my fascination. So you have your autonomous cars, you yes. have the car that understands your behavior, where you want to go, that you don't have to drive, it's driverless. Then you have your Android slash artificial intelligence, who is the human companion that looks after the human as well in their home when they're traveling from birth to death. 
Yeah. Um, so it's maybe not in the early part of my lifetime, but possibly in the later part of my lifetime, I would love to have, say, a Javier, a Javier that looks after me in my home as I'm aging. And, you know, as my cognitive features start to decline, Javier will make sure that, you know, I'm connected to my community, my family members, you know, and remind me of the things that I like. So I might forget things, but also if I need to go somewhere, I go, Javier, pick me up in five minutes, I need to go shopping. So within five minutes, my car is downstairs waiting for me and talking to me at the same time. Right. Okay. <laughs> right. So that saves actually having to talk to human beings, is it? Is that this? Well, it's not. I think it's making things efficient and productive because, Okay. yeah, I, I don't believe it's unfair to rely too much on humans to do menial tasks. Right. And I'm an independent type of person. So to continue that independence through my elderly age, I would love to have this AI robot. So, you know, I envision a future where I have Javier, Javier picks me up outside, is in the car, is talking to me, is going to take me to the shops um, or pick up my parents and deliver them to my cousin's place. Um, you know, when I'm in my home, Javier is either in an Android form robot or, you know, AI, um, making sure that I'm okay in my home. Right. Okay. So this is, so you've then taken this sort of vision and put it into trying to sell this to corporate is that right i mean is there a particular <laughs> is there a particular <laughs> back to reality <laughs> yeah, back to this thing yeah yes. where well, you have to actually pay the rent um <laughs> how are you so with radmus then give us a quick sort of the elevator pitch on what you're doing with with radmus yeah so radmus is um enterprise software yeah we automate processes for enterprise organizations basically helping them transform digitally um to you know, more of an, uh, a cost-effective way of doing business. So, for instance, if they have, you know, 10 people doing work and they need to expand to 100, we'll find ways to actually make things efficient, processes and automation. So through that, AI, uh, specifically? Uh, uh, okay, so specifically through automation. AI, I think people have a, a different view of what AI is. Okay. And I think Google set the expectations uh, <laughs> too high. AI is, in my term... When he understands and he's self-aware, then that's a smart AI. Where we are now, we're just scratching the surface. Right. At okay. the moment, it's about automation. It's about machine learning. It's about vis visual machine learning. But AI in its true form doesn't actually exist. Right. Okay. Yet. So, so you're you're at the early stages of selling automation uh, solutions, but with the, AI the future of AI built yes, in. That's, that's right. Is that really where it's at? Yes. I guess. Okay. Yes. Perfect. And then, I mean, I know we've met a few times at blockchain events. So, what's your fascination with blockchain then? Because I know that's, you know, sort of on the peripheral of your core activities, but you seem yes. to be getting more and more into it. So, I'm, I'm interested how you got, how into, you got into that. Absolutely. So, I was a payments consultant back in the day when uh, that Satoshi white paper uh, came up. <laughs> in the market that would have been about 2008 2000 yeah, probably 2008, around yeah, yeah probably about 2009 i think it actually got released or floated around around 2008 it didn't actually hit little circles until about 2009 and when i was a payments consultant i really loved the idea of peer-to-peer -peer payments right and i was scratching scratching looking for ways and mps was in the market and uh you know i was consulting at the time to help organizations look at how they transfer money and um, utilize um, mobile money mobile wallet and so forth and in came cryptography and transfer of payments and transfer of value and this satoshi white paper i'm like mm, this is interesting so it was more of a discovery and interest it was academic and then you know Things start to bubble up, and then friends are like, "Oh, we're mining things. Mining? What are you mining? <laughs> mining value." So that became okay. really interesting. So it wasn't because yeah. William Shatner suddenly became Satoshi Nakamoto. <laughs> you don't think he, Captain Kirk is, <laughs> is is Satoshi, or maybe he is. I maybe, don't know. Maybe he is. Maybe. <laughs> okay. um, so really, right at the early stages then of yeah. blockchain. Of blockchain. But AI's been your passion since you were three. So. I would say I'm guessing that's probably about 15 years ago. Your, your, your youth and charm. You're too kind. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But um, I mean, I guess one of the things that I perhaps have challenges with is in terms of definitions, and I know a lot of our audience will have this in relation to you know AI and big data and machine learning because they mm -hmm. all seem to fit into the same bucket to yes. a lot of people. 
And to me, you know, I mean, AI, I appreciate it sort of, it's making decisions based on pure yes. um, data that's available. Yes. But do you want to just give a quick differentiation of what, the difference between AI, big data and machine learning then, just sure. to put a bit of clarity around that? So I would say AI is an overall arcing uh, concept uh, where there's components of different things that make artificial intelligence what we believe it should yep. be. Uh, basically, smarter than humans, yeah? Smarter than humans. At the same time, it would make its own decisions and will be self-aware. So, again, everyone's sc scratching the surface. Machine learning is basically the machine is computing either algorithms or um, visual images, and it is starting to make its own decision and find patterns in data, lots of data. When I When people talk about big data, it's basically a lot of data that right. that software normal software um, that you buy say you know um, on the market uh, won't be able to handle so you need different strategies to manage um, you know this lake of data it's just in that simple form yeah right okay so when you're selling the the radness solutions are you you're with the the automated processes are you digging into those machine learnings and big data? I do, but I focus on the customer's business first. So right, okay. technology is an enabler. Right, yeah, okay. You yep. cannot sell the technology. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Um, my approach is, well, understand the customer's business and how can we save them time and money? Right. Yeah, or improve their customer experience. Okay. Um, and, you know, how, how can they gain efficiencies within their business? So, for instance, if um, they're doing eight hours a week just processing orders, how can we automate that so that eight hours a week becomes half an hour? Right, okay. So we're adding value to the organization using components of artificial intelligence, just first being automation, yeah. um, automating their current processes onto our platform that will help them manage their, their business processes. Okay. Yeah. And, and does blockchain come into those discussions, do you find, at all? Uh, I think people are curious about it. We right. don't have a blockchain offering specifically with yeah. our solution. Right. Hence, there's, I'm in two worlds at the moment. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, so I'm in the world where um, you know, I'm used to software development, building enterprise applications, looking at you know, risk profiling um, uh, transactions on that level, automating business processes. And I'm in another world that's, you know, about decentralization, putting things on the blockchain, um, you know, dividing up basically cryptocurrency on one side and the value of the technology, which is blockchain, which I believe will fundamentally change how we do things in this world. Because it's yeah. interesting. I mean, I, I know that uh, when we spoke previously, you were in Malta. Yes. Um, for the, the blockchain, uh, you know, the launch of the Maltese government uh, blockchain initiative. Yes. Uh, which I found fascinating in terms of you know your deep interest in AI and yes. um, and, uh, and and obviously your interest in in blockchain. And I know that we'll you know it will talk. I'm sure a lot more about this because you said um, that Malta are right at the leading edge of a number of different things. I mean, yes. do you want to just give a, a bit of a flavour of that? Because Malta absolutely. absolutely in the blockchain space are yes. right at the leading edge yes. of regulation in the blockchain space. And I mean, just ha with you having been there um, and your observations. What? How do you see Malta have have structured themselves? Yeah, well, have structured their approach towards regulation because you mentioned that they've been innovative in yes. earlier stages. So, just give us your your take on that. Actually, it all triggered off when a friend of mine was actually on the um, Maltese side of the equation and helping run it, run the Delta Summit. And uh, Andrea said to me, "Hey, we're doing this event." You know, blockchain, it's pretty big. Um, government's getting involved. I'm like, oh, that's quite interesting. And he said, oh, by the way, the government is actually quite serious about this. They've passed three policies into their government, three laws into, into, into parliament. And I looked into it further. And the more I dug, I thought, oh, hang on, this little island <laughs> in the middle of Europe at the boot of Italy is doing really awesome things. In 2001, I learned that they regulated gaming. And I thought, hang on, if they've passed three laws into Parliament to regulate the arrangement of technologies, say blockchain, and everything that comes off the back of it, cryptocurrency, ICOs, and businesses around the blockchain or DLT 
um, family, there's a little bit more to it because the other governments haven't been able to bring any consensus to the table on how they're going to deal with it. And if they will be the first ones to do this, all the other governments will follow suit. So I thought, that's really interesting. I want to be there. I want to be there to talk to these people, to understand how they got together and the reasons why, and maybe how other countries can get involved and, you know, collaborate. Because you mentioned that they are looking deeply into AI as well. Do you want to give give us a quick... Give us a yeah. quick interpretation on where, where that is going from, from Malta's perspective. From Malta's perspective, yeah. Well, first of all, I think Malta is very smart, yeah. They're a little country, and to gain relevance, they have to do something innovative, big, different, which is basically what they're doing now. Three laws into parliament for di- distributed ledger technologies, and the next thing they're going to tackle is artificial intelligence. So I believe they're going to be in the forefront by at least putting a line in the sand on how the government will behave towards the AI technologies coming into play. And um, without going into too much detail, they will look at things like ethics and right. how um, ethics plays into artificial intelligence and when um, AI technologies are being produced, how it impacts society, how it impacts you know their economy as well. So rather than burying their head in the sand and hoping that you know they'll ride the wave, they're taking proactive measures and steps to ensure that their people are ready and prepared. How right. do they basically, um, you know, uh, <laughs> move their people up the value chain? Mm-hmm. So essentially then, Malta is a place to really watch in terms of AI and blockchain regulation combined if those technologies really do start to take off together. Absolutely. They're going to be right at the forefront of it. They are, absolutely. And um, there's one particular company that has combined both AI and um, blockchain. Yeah, so there's one company. Yeah, there's one particular company that I've been monitoring and reading up on and, and touching base with. They're called Singularity Net. Mm-hmm. So Singularity Net has combined AI and blockchain together. So AI on blockchain, which is, uh, I think it's brilliant idea. And they were probably the first, they are the first <laughs> to um, bring those two together. Yeah. So, I mean, you know the founder of Singularity Net from what you said. Yeah, so a couple of founders, um, Ben Gotzil I've met, um, Simone Giacomelli. So Ben comes from the AI world right. and Simone comes from the blockchain world. So what's, so what's, their, what's their value proposition overall then? I mean, I, I'm, I've, I've heard of Singularity Net yes. and had a look at it and there was Sophie yeah. the Robot and that type of stuff. But yeah. Again, I'm taking that, <laughs> that holistic view yes. without getting too knee-deep in the weeds. Yeah. It would be interesting to hear... Yeah, given your uh, my view, yeah. your view on the AI as, yeah, to, yeah. as to what they're doing. Yeah, so Sophia the robot is only as good as the information that she can actually provide mm-hmm. or have under her. So how do you access, how do you train her? Mm-hmm. That's going to be a lot of data right. coming from every facet of society. We don't have time in this lifetime to make her smart enough. So they thought, oh, how do we decentralize <laughs> um, Sophia being able to learn more and faster? Okay. So hence the two shall meet. Right. Let's make, okay. how do we empower Sophia? How do we get her access to enough content, enough data, enough learning and algorithms that's, you know, create singularity net, which is basically AI connected to other AIs. Right. So... How does that affect the performance of Sophia then? Because as you were saying before, yeah. you can't sell the technology, you've got to you've got to sell the solution. How does that make a human well, I mean, how does it make yeah, you know, uh, humanity better, for yes. example? If you've got all this the decentralized structure that's yes. bringing information together into Sophia. I mean, yes. I mean, what's the what's the value proposition? Yeah. So, well, first of all, I bring it back down to the intent. Okay. And the company's intent. And everyone's scared about AI and where it's going to head towards. But I, again, bring it back to, back to the intent of the founder. The founder of Singularity Net, between um, uh, Simone and um, Ben Gotzel, their intentions are good. It's about how do they take te- technology to solve world problems, basically. So it, it comes okay. from a good place. And I know that because ben, Ben's mother runs an NGO in Africa, and um, he actually trains developers in Africa. So he actually wants this technology 
to be provided to people who need it the most, yeah? So, for example, what, what would an example of that be? Climate change, yeah? You've got countries basically all over the world that are experiencing climate change. The ones that don't have access to funding, to capital, to resources are going to suffer, and they're suffering. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's a deeper discussion altogether. You know, when people can't feed their families, they have no choice. They have no choice but to do things that they don't want to do. Right, and then you've got okay. another problem that, you know, is displacing humans basically so how does yeah. sophia with ai and blockchain solve? could help yeah could so- solve that so uh ben has i think recently i did see um an announcement that he's working with the un on education so how do okay. they educate right. the population right. uh, where i see it contributing uh, value the most is about well how can we help these countries that are experiencing problems to access machine learning, components of artificial intelligence to solve their own problems. So they're not right. so dependent on foreign aid. Right. So okay. if I'm a farmer yeah. in, you know, a third world country, if I get access to this technology to be able to crunch enough data on, you know, historical trends on climate and how nations that are experiencing climate change have um, combated that. So if I've come from a, a winter country and now my country is like really hot and summery, how can I learn from the likes of Saudi Arabia and Australia and implement what they've done with agriculture? Right. Okay. So the AI component, I guess. Yeah. So the decentralized structure, how does that fit into that overall? I, I mean, yeah. and you, may be, you may not know the answer to that. I don't know. But, uh, well, it's actually let's crowdsource the problem. Let's crowdsource right. the, um, the solution as well um, by giving access to... AI engineers all around the world. Right, okay. Yeah. So the AI engineers work together in Correct. a decentralized structure to create solutions that will actually help the third world. So if they're looking at the problem of climate change, yes. then all these AI engineers can actually help them try and structure that. Correct. Right. Okay. And they can actually monetize the alg- algorithms as well. So they, they've created, okay. So he's created right. a marketplace, essentially. Yeah? Okay, yeah. right. All right. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. So, all right, so decentralize the... the the power of the or the wisdom of the crowd correct yeah and then localizing it in yeah. areas that are challenged yeah and, so, the, and creating the that network effect yeah right okay <laughs> interesting so i mean i mean with ai i mean one of the one of the fascinations i have with ai and smart contracts mm-hmm. all right essentially that smart contracts in a decentralized structure at least once yes. they're actually released out there to the world yes you cannot take them back right so yes. if You've actually got a smart contract mm-hmm. that has got a bug in it. Yes. And maybe it's linked into AI, linked into a robot. Mm-hmm. All right. And that bug materializes. And maybe it's been placed there. I don't know. I mean, it materializes and the robot just yes. goes ahead. Is that something that we should be worried about? Uh, yeah, to a certain degree. Um, I bring it back down to the creators <laughs> for them to do enough due diligence and design to ensure they've put checks and balances in place that things like that don't happen. You're not meant to create back doors, but I do believe, you know, I've taken a lesson from an episode of Star Trek, Discovery. Okay. <laughs> I have to give this example. Star Trek, I'm That's have to it. Look at uh, Star Trek with a different, uh, yeah, different light now. I, I have to give this example. So the captain was basically stuck in a containment because she was, um, uh, you know, sentenced sentenced to um, solitary confinement, the ship broke apart, except for that um, containment. The AI would not let her out of that room okay. because it thought that she would end her life if she left the room because there was no air outside of that cabin. But she wanted to leave that room to run to another side of the ship. Mm-hmm. And she, in her opinion, she would have made it. So she had to argue with the AI, <laughs> logical reasoning, to convince it that the, her chances of survival are much greater if she takes this risk of being let out of this containment so she can run to the other side. Right. So, so she was able to barter or convince the AI, you know, in terms of saving human life, that was the better decision to make. Right, so sort of almost putting some game theory in there. Yeah. To to sort of to play with that decision. Well, not just game theory. Well, it, it's actually logical reasoning. All right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. So so logical reasoning. All right. So AI would be more around logic rather than say game theory, which I know a lot of blockchain is. I'm, yeah. I'm just all right. Okay. <laughs> it all gets very confusing. It's all confusing. Yes. But 
But I mean, I mean, the, it is all these sort of ethical considerations. I mean, one of the things that that again I know we've spoken about historically is the ethical considerations of the driverless car. Yes. All right. Now, probably a lot of people listening have heard of the cliched version. Mm -hmm. All right. The driverless car is going to be forced to make a uh, it's decision. It's going to be forced to make a decision. Mm -hmm. It's going to have a crash. It has to actually weigh up human life. Mm -hmm. It has to weigh up the the relative considerations yeah and it's the age-old thing you've got the old lady the child and the brick wall oh i hate right? this question <laughs> i know i know absolutely it, yeah. it's it's such a difficult ethical ethical question <laughs> but the usual the thing is where, who does the ai kill now the the cliched answer is obviously the old lady mm. okay so let's put a, a, a an additional spin on that mm -hmm. all right i spoke at an insurance conference yesterday and i was talking to a couple of insurance guys about this yes right? So let's imagine mm -hmm. going forward yes. that driverless cars are around. They've, they're saving 90% of lives, yes. which is what they're projected to save. Roughly. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Insurance levels have come down significantly. Yes. Okay. To get the insurance levels down further, because mm -hmm. most of us who drive, mm -hmm. when we go for insurance, we go, as long as we're getting the same, the same coverage, mm -hmm. we go for the lowest price. Yes. Okay. You're given the option. All right, as a tick box yes. to say, okay, I'm prepared to give you the car, the AI, the choice and decision making capability mm -hmm. to make that decision as to what goes on. Oh my God. All right. <laughs> yes. Okay. But, but, but this is where the twist comes, <laughs> yes, right? Yes. Yes. So we've got the situation that you've, you've saved yourself 20%, let's say, on the insurance. Yes. And then you're faced with exactly the same position. Now, you're driving, Penny, okay? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You're driving. And the car is going to be forced into a into an accident in which it has to make that decision. Yes. Okay. Now, the old lady, the child, and the brick wall, all in, all in front of you. Okay. The actual decision is made because you tick that box mm -hmm. that the AI makes the decision. Mm -hmm. So, you're insured by whoever it might be for the car. Yes. The old lady's got a life insurance policy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. The young child and there's a brick wall. Mm -hmm. So now, because you've signed, tick that box, all right, to allow the AI to make the decision, and the AI decides, hang on a second, commercially, if I make a cold commercial decision, mm -hmm. I'm going to kill the child because there's a life insurance policy which is part, you know, part of the same company. Therefore, yeah, you know, we're going to we're going to cost ourselves money. People should go to jail for this, but anyway, yes. Right, right. No, no but, 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 but this is the issue, right? <laughs> yes. Because then. If we've actually got the AI that's making that decision, mm -hmm, yeah, okay, and we are complicit in yes. terms of saying we give you the authority to make that decision based on your own commercial algorithms, and then you're in the car, and yeah. unfortunately, you kill a child, yeah. all right, even though you haven't been directly responsible for it. Mm -hmm you're going to be spending the rest of your life as a human being. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, looking and saying, did I actually cause the, the death of that child because I signed that to save 20% off my insurance? So first of all, there's a fundamental issue with that. You shouldn't put a, a, a dollar value to human life. So, but, the f But that's the way insurance companies work, surely, in terms of actuarial in, ideas. In terms of actuarial, but not to the point where they've now pass that decision back to the um, insured to actually put that monetary value on life, basically. So my life is worth more than another human life. They've, they have consented and acknowledged and accepted that. Uh, that's wrong, completely wrong. Well, but, but, the, <laughs> yeah. but the reality is if people are just sort of focused yeah. on, I want to get the cheapest insurance. Right? Yes. They probably may not think through some of those ethical challenges. Yes. That's what I'm saying. Yes. Right? Yes. So in that sort of situation, it's it presents a twist yes. to the, the ethical dilemma because yes. then it brings in into account commercial decisions. Yes. To commercial considerations. Yes. And if we extend that one layer further, mm -hmm. all right, not in terms of the ethical consideration, yeah. but in terms of if the car has that first accident in which this is going to be a case, this is going to be It'll case precedence, law, yeah, yeah. Right, and, and creates precedent, right? Yeah. That's going to be very expensive for whoever is involved in it. Yes, that. absolutely. Okay? Mm -hmm. So my question is, would the driverless car, mm -hmm. whoever that might be, and I'm not laying the foundation of, of any besmirching of anybody's character. Well, actually, the owner of the driverless car. 
Well, no, but but the or the, the manufacturer or the actual manufacturer. I mean, ultimately, okay. yeah, we're always going to be querying. Do we? Who do we sue? Do we sue the car manufacturer? Do we sue the software designer? Do we sue the? You know, I mean, do you sue the driver? It's all those considerations are going yeah. to come into play. Well, if it's a lease car, do you sue the uh, the, well, the company? Indeed, yeah. I, I mean, there yeah. could be a whole variety of yeah. different different yeah. metrics there. Uh-huh. Okay, but if we're going to have the first case law, mm-hmm. whoever feels they might be in for a very substantial fine, or yes. yeah, it, it could cost goodness knows how much if it goes to court. Yeah, right. Yeah. And they may commercially. I'm not saying that they would. Yes. But we've seen history of car manufacturers doing certain things that have come out mm-hmm. that have been unethical. Mm-hmm. Could they, for example, tamper with the records, the logs that might show the AI decision making? And is there an argument to say, let's actually put in place a blockchain to define those decisions as to yes. when they're made? Now, my question is, should that be done? And given the volume of data, mm-hmm. would that be practical? I mean, I mean, I guess that's a it's a combination of AI and blockchain and, and yeah. scalability. I Should guess. it be done? Smart contracts, absolutely, because then you can audit trail the decision making uh, process of that AI, that car, what it's doing, and what decisions have been codified. Can it be done? I think it's a huge challenge because it's going to take a lot of time. Uh, a lot of scenarios, a lot of training, eventually we'll get there, but there will be the edge cases that we will always debate over. But I, and I, I guess the very, very first one, that's right. That's right. I, mean, I, mean, I mean, I'm making yeah. extreme, yes. uh, extreme case, yeah. obviously. Yeah. yeah. But it is one of those things. If it's the first case law, yes. You know, yeah. And we want to be completely satisfied that the records are bona fide. Mm. Mm-hmm. You know, do we put blockchain in there? You know, to actually to say those decisions were actually made and, and they were this executed. Is, yeah, yeah. I I agree with that. Yeah, this is this is the a perfect scenario where the two have to come together. I mean, yeah. but, but I mean, I mean, the sheer volume of data would be horrendous. Yeah, and the you know the scalability of actually the the scalability of actually trying to implement that mm. would be horrendous. I mean, it would be yeah. You know, but but it, uh, I guess it does come down to the ethical thing of, of should we do it? Yeah. And I don't know. I mean, would the, what would the Maltese government think? <laughs> well, basically, our first question is, how do you eat an elephant? One piece at a time. <laughs> True. So you would start with, you know, that happy happy path mm-hmm. um, and just try and put some scope around components. And the, the, the smart contract will be around key decisions. And then you start drilling down into granular detail and start building uh, decisions and um, you know, embedding it into smart contracts at that granular level. So you've got to start with a high-level contract first, yeah. and then build towards it as more cases come in, more people work out the different use cases and use different scenarios. As you know, accidents—I hate to say this—occur, <laughs> and new smart contracts get built into it. And just, yeah, I know. I mean, it, it, it sort of opens yeah. up all sorts of. Yeah, horrendous sort of ideas to think about. So all of a sudden, this is the world needs to come together. Government, enterprise, um, you know, the p- general public. We've got now, um, you know, we collaboration of the minds, not just diversity, but the minds as well. You know, in terms of philosophers, creatives, engineers, lawyers, um, people in finance, everyone has to come together to solve these problems because yeah. it affects all of us. Yeah. And what I like about Malta is they're being proactive in making this happen. Rather than waiting for an incident to occur and create that precedent, they're trying to, uh, as much as possible, forecast or predict or put something in place, at least as a starting point. It's yeah. better to start now yeah. than to than to wait until something occurs. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, it is just really fascinating just where tech overall is going and how everything's coming together. I mean, yeah. there was a, a recent Forbes article I, I, I very briefly looked at that yeah. looked at artificial intelligence working, uh, you know, where, where blockchain and AI could work together, where, um, you know, where the AI was actually working while, whilst the data was actually encrypted. And the idea of health records immediately come to mind yes. in terms of that stuff. I mean, is that is that something you're hearing much about? I haven't explored that 
yeah. in detail, but it's definitely something I will look into. Um, you know, given that you know my lifetime goal is to take AI to transform aged care, yeah. I have to consider these things. Yeah. <laughs> um, at the very rudimentary level, it's about you know automation and helping the elderly, but there will be a point where I would have to consider utilizing blockchain. Yeah. But in a practical level, right. I'm not going to utilize it for the sake of utilizing it. I cannot see a full utility at this point. Right. Until I do, that's the point where I'll actually start to bring it into play. Right. Okay. So if, if you had a crystal ball, yeah. just as the final sort of the final sort of lens on on the observations between AI and, and blockchain, what would be your perfect combination of AI and blockchain? My perfect combination. Yes. Bearing in mind your knowledge on both. <laughs> I would have to say what Singularity Net are doing at the moment. Yeah, I think it's great what they're doing. They're giving access to a whole new market, creating a whole new ecosystem to reach these hidden AI developers and engineers buried in universities who have no means or you know interest to actually commercialize their product and approach mm. VCs, but they're intelligent. They're really, right. really smart. They can contribute. And they really want to change the they world. They really want to change the world. Right. Um, so they're giving these guys access. And they these guys are everywhere, but they're just buried in their basements <laughs> or within you know, right. dark halls of universities. Really brilliant guys. How do we get them out? Um, right. So this is, I would say it's kind of a little bit of an uprising. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. So that's, well, that's interesting. So sort of bringing communities together to yes. actually help those problems. For common goals. For yeah. common goals. Yeah. It's, it's, it is. It's, it's a community. Blockchain has created a community around the world of trust, mm. bringing you know people with similar mindsets, similar values. And I've met amazing people traveling uh, all through the blockchain community. And yeah. I think that for me, that's the successful part in um, this technology coming in and, and you know actually emerging in the world. It's actually connecting people. Right. Yeah. Excellent. Look, this has been this has been really great, Penny. Thank you for for coming in. I mean, it's uh, um, it's interesting to hear about your background and your fascination with Star Trek. I mean, it's uh, <laughs> and how that's sort of guiding. It's a guiding light in terms of where you're seeing things go. You're yeah, seeing things go in the future and and the singularity net. I mean, that's got some really sort of interesting things. I mean, I guess the I suppose the last thing I need to say is probably beam me up, Penny. Is that what we've got to say? I don't know, just to finish it off. But yeah. uh, but no, thanks for coming in. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you. Yeah, we'll look towards um, you know, getting an update in sort of three or six months or something, just to find out yeah you know, how far the two are coming together in terms of. Well, hopefully you can come to Malta with me and you can meet um, <laughs> uh, Dr. Abdullah Kablan, who's um, instrumental in those changes, and he's he's the lead in the whole AI agenda in, in Malta. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. That, and I mean, Ben got sell uh, as well. Oh, right. <laughs> and I mean, Sophia the Robot. I mean, Charles. I'm finding it hard enough <laughs> to stay in touch with everything in the, the blockchain space, let alone the AI stuff. But but I do find some of the ethical considerations really fascinating. Yeah, you know, likewise. And yeah. just you know, digging deep into that. And I think where Malta are positioning themselves, I think, uh, yeah, I'm going to have to definitely get over to Malta, I think. so. Uh, but look, thanks, Penny. Appreciate it. And we'll talk soon. Thank you. Okay. So there you have it. Artificial intelligence and blockchain appear to have some challenges when working together. On the one hand, there appears to be a juxtaposed position between the sheer volume of data necessary for artificial intelligence to perform effectively and the scalability of the blockchains currently in use. Scalability is the nirvana for the blockchain industry and will continue to be so, but it is likely the data required to power AI is going to continue to grow. Perhaps the best use case to be found for the two technologies working together is the collective use of remote engineers helping process the excessive data required to run artificial intelligence systems. Clearly, both technologies have a long way to go to be optimized. In the next episode, I will be talking with Alejandro Betancourt, a Venezuelan lawyer who now lives in Sydney. We talk about the day-to-day -day life of living in Venezuela where the annual inflation rate is 500,000%. To put this into perspective, if you buy a cup of coffee today for $3.50, in a week's time, the same cup of coffee would cost you $35. Even though Bitcoin has seen serious falls in price this year, it is considerably more stable than the local Venezuelan Bolivar. 
Does Bitcoin have a role to play in countries that are experiencing difficult economic conditions? Find out more in the next episode as we continue on our journey down the rabbit hole.